going to listen to me speak. So I'm always uh, humble, you know, people show up and hear me talk. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so as uh, Josh mentioned, I am a member of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Um, so my mother is Seminole. My father is uh, Tejano or Tex-Mex. He's a American-born Mexican. And uh, so that's a little bit of my background. Um, you know, so I... I started carving when I was about 14 years old. That's when I started learning how to do it. Um, really focusing on the canoes probably in the last maybe eight, nine years or so. Um, that I've uh, really gotten into trying to, you know, refine the canoes and work on them and try and do different community projects. And so tonight I'm just going to kind of go over, you know, a little bit of different aspects. You know, a lot of you probably heard some of these things from me um, while you guys were listening to me, you know, uh, and asking questions while I was carving. Um, but hopefully I'll cover some things that maybe you didn't hear. Um, plus I'll try and provide lots of beautiful imagery, you know, um, things that's hard for me to do while I'm uh, down there, you know. It's, it looks much better up here than like if I show you on a cell phone screen or something like that. So, um, so this is actually a really beautiful image. Um, this comes from... Uh, just after the turn of the century. So this is probably somewhere between 1907 or 1910. Um, there's these uh, wealthy New Yorkers, uh, the Dimmicks, that decide they're just going to go down to the Everglades and go fishing and go across the Everglades and over to Miami. Um, this is 1907. <laughs> there was no Alligator Alley. There was no US 41. Um, there was no roads across the Everglades. <laughs> Um, but they did it. And uh, that first trip, I think they saw one Seminole. <laughs> um, and he was in the distance. And then they camped in a few Seminole camps. They found that it was curious that they get to those camps and there were no Seminoles in them, but the fires were still smoldering. Um, and this is not that long after the Seminole Wars. You know, there's still fear of uh, relocation. And so that, you know, uh, rightly so, we were still pretty skeptical of uh, outsiders that we did not know. Um, you know, there were obviously traders and things that we worked with, but we, you know, knew those families, knew who they were, and, uh, you know, trusted working with them. Um, this gentleman here, uh, his name is Charlie Cypress, and he actually ended up working uh, later in his life at Silver Springs. Um, him and his family would go up there and live in the Seminole Village uh, at the time that section that was called Ross Allen's Reptile Institute. And, uh, and he would carve canoes up there. And so I'm going to go over kind of the different things that what makes it a seminal canoe, you know, what makes it unique to us, um, you know, what features and things like that. So he's called Cypress. You know, a lot of people ask, you know, oh, do we use uh, outriggers in our canoes? And I say, no, a long time ago, we just got a bigger tree. <laughs> um, because we used to have bigger tree before uh, commercial logging came through. I think it was around 1958. They stopped logging for old growth cypress in the big cypress swamp. Um, and it stopped then because they ran out. They ran out old growth cypress. Um, and so there's actually only one forest of old growth cypress that's intact that you can go see. It is at the Audubon Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. Um, they don't have any quite this big, and this one was standing until recently. Unfortunately, this tree did burn down uh, several years ago. It was named the Senator. It was the uh, world champion cypress tree. Uh, as you can see, it's about 12 feet in diameter. Um, there's another one there that's still impressive. It's eight feet across, but it's still not nearly as huge as the Senator was. Um, so the you have different parts of the tree anatomy, I guess. And so you kind of see this reddish area around here. And then you kind of see this white, lighter colored area out there. So this lighter area is the sapwood. And everything in here is the heartwood. So the reason it has that reddish color is because that wood has cypressine, which is the natural oil that's in cypress. That's what makes, makes it resistant to rot and insects. But it's only in that heartwood. It's not in the sapwood at all. So I get fallen trees out of the woods. Um, so most of the time this sapwood is uh, rotten. Sometimes it's still on there, but it's like 
it literally feels like a sponge on the outside of the tree is so soft. Um, you can actually push it and water like squeezes out of it. Um, but then the heartwood, because of that oil, naturally occurring oil, is still intact and in usable uh, shape. So you'd look at the tree sitting in the swamp and you would think it's unusable just by the outside appearance, but the heartwood is still in good shape. So I think sometimes we end up like that. We might not look usable, but we still got the heart. You know? <laughs> Um, something, you know, the, the way the bow and the stern are shaped um, is kind of the distinctive features of the canoe. You know, obviously the middle canoe is just kind of a, a hollow area, you know, it's pretty much the same from group to group, you know, it's long straight sides. Um, but depending on where you're at, you know, what kind of, and what water you're using that canoe in will kind of determine the shape of the, the bow and the stern. Um, some parts in the, of the world, the bow and the stern are identical, or sometimes they're very similar. Uh, where ours, we have this upswept stern and then this pointed bow. Um, now, this pointed bow does work very well in the sawgrass. It helps part the grass and keeps you in the water instead of riding up on top of the grass, especially when the water is very shallow when it's only like, you know, seven or eight inches deep. Um, this is another Dimmick photo. So this. A little boy here, they, uh, the photographer has named him Tadpole. <laughs> and you see he's already learning how to use a push pole. So people I, you know, ask me about balance, well you start learning very young. You know, just almost like walking. You know, you know, technically, physically, walking should be nearly impossible, but yet we all do it. We start learning at a very young age. So uh, this is another canoe that I've started working on. It was one of the, the first ones I started working on. Um, and kind of see earlier in the process kind of how it starts uh, getting the kind of sweep on the, the bow there. And uh, so, and then my canoe out there, I do have some thicker parts there. You can see this is still solid in the middle of the canoe. Um, on longer canoes, I will leave that in there for um, most of the construction of the canoe. What that does is it keeps the sides of the canoe from uh, curling in as the wood's drying. So think about like if you get a piece of paper wet and you set it up to dry, the, the middles will start to curl in. And, um, the wood will do the same thing actually. And uh, sometimes if you see like some old photos of you know Seminole dugout canoes or really any dugout canoe, sometimes you'll see the middle kind of still warps in. So, uh, so here's Stern. This is uh, my uncle Leroy there. He was helping me, um, especially at the time. He was much more experienced at it than than I was at making dugout canoes. So, the days he was there, we got a lot more work done. <laughs> he uh, uh, definitely had more of an idea of you know how the shapes went and things like that. Um, so this, you know, right now the canoe is turned upside down. So you have my little nifty little model there so it's just like that right there so you're seeing that part of the canoe and then right here you're seeing the top side of the stern and uh, you can kind of see some of the cross cuts from the chainsaw in there so we make cross cuts and you can go back and knock it out with an axe or an adze um, so again, you know, the canoes are designed for different areas. Um, you can see here, um, this is a really neat image. Um, so this is what a Seminole camp would look like. Like, because a lot of the Seminole camps that people saw or have seen were what we call tourist camps. They're designed for tourists to come in, pay a, a nickel or a dime or a quarter or whatever the going rate was in what year. And, um, and then you come through and uh, see how the Seminoles lived. This is not one of those camps. This is out on a, on a hammock uh, somewhere out in the Everglades. This photo is taken from a blimp. Um, so in the center here, this is the, um, the cooking chickie. You can see it has an open end. You see none of the other chickies have open ends on them. So the chickie is just our thatch hut. It's our, it's our word for um, a home or building or structure. Um, so, and so the cooking one has an open end, so it helps let the smoke out as you know when you're cooking over a fire. 
And uh, so over here, it looks like they have probably bananas or something like that growing here and here, and they have uh, pens around them, keep hogs and things out of them. Um, you know, because you don't have a refrigerator, so you keep your animals uh, on the hoof until you're ready to eat them. <laughs> and uh, but it's really cool is you can kind of see canoe trails coming into their. They have some docks here, and so there's one right here that's coming in. You can see really well. I think that's just an artifact on the photo there, but this one's the trail coming in. So, in the Everglades, this is um, was pretty typically how we how we lived and how we stay so isolated for so long. Um, and until drainage, you know, we we're pretty much left alone because uh, most people didn't want to live in that way. Um, and as you can see, you know, we also sailed our canoes. Um, a lot of people are surprised to hear that, that, you know, we actually saw sails, you know, being used for, you know, 400 years and decided that we would use them as well. Um, you know, because you know, it's, um, I think it's part of, part of how Native Americans are taught about. You know, a lot of people tend to think that Native Americans kind of live in this historical bubble and that we never evolved out of that, especially when it comes to our uh, material art or material culture, that it never evolved, that it's been the same for the last four or 500 years, thousand years. Um, and just like anything else, it will evolve over time as new... Uh, technologies become available or as new ideas become available, those things will change. Um, and so one of those things was that we got sales. Um, I just love this photo. <laughs> this, and this is from that Dimmick expedition. You know, I use those photos a lot just because they're just really beautiful. They, they actually had a really great eye for composition before, way before photography was considered an art. You know, it was just considered strictly, you know, documentation at this time. You know, photography and art were not considered in the same realm. But their photos, they managed to capture some beautiful imagery. Um, and this is kind of a typical summer day in the Everglades. You know, there's just rain pelting sideways. I don't know if you can see it from where you're at, but the rain's going literally at a 45 degree angle. I know we've all seen those Florida rains like that. Just usually we're in our car in our house, not walking a canoe through it. Um, this one here, you can see a little bit of the boards of the platform in the back of the canoe. Here there's a, a push pole in the back of the canoe. Um, I think he's wearing a, what they call a, I think that's like a conductor's cap. I'm trying to remember the turn of the century hats that were in style at the time, because uh, you know we were always trying to stay in style and up to date. <laughs> um, I kind of already mentioned this, but how we move them. Generally, in the Everglades, the water is pretty shallow, um, so it's usually the most efficient way is with a push pole. Um, and pretty much anywhere around the world where watercraft are used in shallow water, they use a push pole to propel themselves. Um, but we also um, still continue to use that sail. This one's called a sprit rig, this particular kind. Um, you see she's got it way loaded down, but um, you know, it seems like she really knows what she's doing to, to <laughs> keep this balance and sail it and still use a, she's using a push pole to help steer it as well. Um, you know, and this sail is made from old flour sacks. Plus she has, you know, whatever the 15, 20 pounds of beads that women wore at the time. Another just a really nice uh, image showing the, the mast. And let's see, this one looks like it's probably earlier just by his clothing. He's, this is probably more around like 1890 or so. And uh, I always tell people we don't really know what our canoes look like before about the 1880s, 1890s, just because we don't have any photographs from before then um, of Seminole canoes, and we don't have any existing examples of Seminole canoes from that time period, um, and we don't even have any drawings or sketches of uh, dugout canoes from before then. Um, so again, this is going back to some of the earliest images of Seminoles and canoes. Um, this one's kind of interesting because the back end has been truncated, it looks like they put a, a board on the back. Um, 
you know, it could be that it was intentionally made that way, or it's possible the back just split, and so they and patched it and went on their way. That means cut the back. <laughs> <laughs> and there's just a close-up. Um, yeah, you can see a little bit of the paint on the gunnel there of the canoe. You've got an American flag flying up there. Um, so here's the end of the push pole. So there is something on the end there because even though it's technically like ground you're pushing into, it is still pretty mushy. Um, so the, this kind of foot here on the end of the push pole helps keep the pole from getting stuck in the mud. Um, you can also paddle with it as you need to um, or rudder with it. You know, it just depends. Um, I know when I use it, I tend to kind of like do a paddle and then a push, and that kind of helps keep the canoe uh, straight when you're using it, so you don't have to keep switching sides as, as often. Um, you know, I'm not that good to where I can do it completely from one side, but I've seen some of the elders, you know, push pull around. They no problem. They keep it all on one side and keep the canoe going straight. But uh, yes, I'm not quite that good at it yet. Um, so that's kind of all the nuts and bolts of it, but so why, why are they important? You know, it's, is it just an object or is it more than an object? You know, people tend to think of, um, especially things that kind of fall towards more of the, the craft side or utilitarian side as simply objects. Um, but for, for Seminoles at least, and I think it's pretty common in a lot of Native America, is these objects contain so much cultural knowledge. Because um, with uh, everything we do, there's just um, a lot of knowledge, protocol, cultural elements, traditions that are taught with different things. Um, you know, I tend to like to call it cultural etiquette. Um, but here you can just see a family standing in a canoe. People ask me how many people can fit in a canoe. Um, obviously, this is a much larger canoe than the one I'm building downstairs, but if it's large enough, you can put, you know, your whole family in there. Um, this is probably a canoe that's closer, you know, it's probably over 20 feet long, though. It's a little hard to tell because of the, the angle, but it also looks like it's pretty wide to me. Um, so I'm guessing this one's probably um, well over two feet wide. It's kind of another cool image. Um, you can see they mm -hmm. took a little artistic liberty in their paintwork inside the canoe there. Again, there's not really any traditional, uh, you know, specific way that a canoe had to be painted. Um, it was up to the person that made it. So a lot of times they're literally just painted like one color and they might paint a different color on the gun on and that's it. But you can see this one, they got a little fancier and there's different color blocks all along it. You can see a much older woman there. Um, not quite sure if she's paddling or if it's a push pull or, or what she has going on there. Um, as far as shape, this one's much more square and cross section. Um, I see that sometimes it's definitely like kind of atypical for Seminole canoes to be kind of like this. Usually they have um, have that chine, that angle, um, but that one's almost square. It has a different bow. Um, that's the same shape bow. It's, it's, oh, okay, I can't see. It's just, uh, oh. it's kind of going off screen there, but it is it's still kind of pointed up. Okay. So it's still like that. It. Pedro? And uh, you can see a platform. Pedro, do you have the vintage of that photo? Uh, you mean like the date? Yeah, how old is that photo? Uh, this this is a Dimmick photo, so it's between 1907 and 1910. Can I just love the photos? I use them a lot. Um, and it's really, and what's another cool thing is um, most of the photos they took, I mean, a lot of them are relatively candid. Um, so usually, again, when you're looking at photos of Native Americans, a lot of times they're very posed. And oftentimes a lot of the cultural items they're wearing aren't even from their tribe. Like, people love the Curtis photos, you know, he's so famous for his photos of 
Native Americans from across the country, but he also carried a trunk of items with him so you could kind of dress up the Indians if he thought they didn't look fancy enough for his photos. Wow. That's a good picture. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah, and you can see one of the canoe trails going off. You can see, you know, some small hammocks up there. Actually, I, we're asking, um, a quick question though. Sure. Uh, do the, so how do these canoe trails form? Is it just from just constant usage with the push poles? Or yeah, well, I mean, like in the sawgrass, yeah, you just, just through use, they'll open up, but then you go through areas like, you know, mangroves and stuff like that, then you do have to, you know, cut and maintain a trail. So if there's active maintenance going on with, with those? Some of them, like I said, like this, just through the grass, you just go through it and it would stay open. And that's but, the roof. Yeah, but like, you know, the Turner River um, down my way, um, we used to maintain that. There's a lot of mangroves in a few parts of that river system. Um, so we'd actively trim back the mangroves so that we could stand and push pull through them. Now they're growing over and there's just a little opening and you have to like lay down to like get through them. Everyone thinks, oh, this is so great, it's fun. Uh, it's like, can we just open it back up like we used to do it? But the National Park says, no, we can't just cut the mangroves back. <laughs> But uh, so yeah, so in areas like that, we would act, you know there was active maintenance going to keep the river open and and much more usable. So here you can see more families. So I've mentioned to several people how we would make canoes specifically for children. And you can see how this one's much smaller and narrower than the other canoes that are sitting sitting there. Um, so just like any transportation, we have different sized canoes, just like you have different sized vehicles today or different size you know, ships out in the water. Um, just depends on what it's for. Is it for recreation? Is it for family? Is it for you know, just fishing for a couple hours? Or is it to haul cargo across the ocean? Um, just kind of similar to that. You know, is it just a couple of kids playing in it? Is it big enough for you know, a couple of hunters to go out and go uh, hunting for a few days? Um, or is it big enough to hold your entire family and, you know, trade goods to get to the trading post? So we have everything from like 12 and 14 foot canoes to, you know, up to 30 feet long. So the 30 foot ones, those were the, the minivan canoes. <laughs> um, and what happened to the trees? Well, it's just logging. <laughs> Um, this is a cypress tree. This is not a redwood or sequoia. This is a cypress tree. So, yeah, you know, if I went back 70, 80 years, I could have easily found trees the size to make canoes from. Today, most of these are gone. They're that size. Um, there's a few left here and there in pockets. Um, mostly it's just due to, you know, uh, an area not being economically viable for the logging companies to, to get to. Um, because down in the Big Cypress Swamp, when they were logging these, they'd actually build um, narrow gauge rail lines out to, into the cypress heads. Um, and that's how they would actually get the logs out of the swamps and then over to the large gauge rail. And then they would be um, by train up to the sawmills, wherever they were at. Um, you know, because down in the Big Cypress Swamp, there's not just these big rivers that they can get them to and then go by a river like they did in other parts of Florida, other parts of the southeast. Yes? So I'm curious, about how many canoes would you get out of that? Um, it would depend on the size of the canoe you're making and depends on what the top of the tree looked like. Um, if it's a really healthy, really tall tree, you might be able to get two canoes out of it. Um, or if using a really big tree, you want to make a canoe that's a little smaller, you could split the tree down the middle and make two, but that wasn't very common to do it that way, um, especially down here. There's other parts of the southeast, like in Louisiana, um, to make the, the Cajun pea rows. Um, it's really common for them to split the logs in half and then make two canoes, but their canoes are also much lower than ours. But again, just like us, they're using them in very flat, calm waters. So they could make a, a low canoe. By, by low, I mean like the 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 
top of your canoe wasn't very high up. So, you know, logging just really decimated it. Again, this is a cypress tree. This is a cypress tree that this man is standing on. It's probably over six feet across. So You'd like to have a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have worked on a few um, sinker cypress logs, so ones that came out of river bottoms, because you know where they did use the rivers to haul the logs to the sawmill. Um, you know, there's estimates that up to about 20% of those logs didn't make it to the sawmill. They would just sink in the river along the way. And uh, because what they would do, um, a lot of times what would happen, again, if it was a big cypress swamp, they probably wouldn't do as much, but a lot of other times they would go out to a forest six months to a year ahead of time, and they would do what's called girdle the tree. And it was basically you just cutting a notch, kind of like this, but all the way around the tree. And so and what that would do is that would kill the tree because it's actually only the outer couple rings of the tree that are alive. So once you cut through those all the way around, it kills the tree. And it can no longer send nutrients and water and everything up to the leaves. And um, so they would do that ahead of time, six months to a year, to hopefully dry out the tree just enough so that when they took it to the river, it would actually float all the way to the sawmill. But um, again, River divers will tell you there's still a lot of logs hanging out in the bottom of the river that didn't make it. Um, or there'd be a log jam and they'd just sit there so long that um, they'd reabsorb water and sink to the bottom. Just a few more images. And you can see the man sitting on these very large logs. So again, like one like this, you could easily split that in half and make two very good sized canoes. Um, but I don't know if that was really happening with, out of the Seminole canoes I've seen, I really haven't really ever seen that done. Usually you just kind of make it to the dimension of the, the log that you cut. Mm. So, and if you want to see some big ones still, the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary is between Naples and Immokalee. Again, this is the largest continuous forest of old growth Cypress left anywhere in the world. Um, it was nearly completely uh, logged out as well, though. Um, and if you look at a satellite, the bottom half of it did get logged out, um, but local citizens managed to stop it and would convince the company to, to sell the remaining property um, because this was going to be the last property for them to log. And because again, after this, it would be gone. Um, if I remember right, I think the only stipulation for the sale was that the um, president of the logging company wanted the forest to be named after him. <laughs> um, fortunately, the name has changed to something more appropriate. It wasn't <laughs> What's that? It wasn't corkscrew. No. Yeah. Sure. Um, and it's probably the, the journey to get it saved. Though. <laughs> but I mean, there are some beautiful old growth trees out there. So I mean, if you're ever down in southwest Florida and Fort Myers, Naples area. Um, take a day trip out to the Corkscrew Swamp. It is just absolutely beautiful area. Um, so again, you know, this is a continuous unbroken tradition for Seminoles. Um, you know, and you've probably heard me say, you know, that I'm not trying to recreate a historical process. I'm just trying to make, continue the tradition of making the canoe by, you know, whatever is the best tools and materials to do that with. Um, so as you saw a photo earlier, we use chainsaws, but then we also use axes. We also have the museum recording it sometimes. <laughs> um, this is Shammy Tommy. Um, so he was learning how to make uh, canoes with me as well. Um, and so he's from our Fort Pierce community. Um, He's one of our few fluent speakers of the Creek language that we have in, in the tribe. Um, it's a little bit of a side note because a lot of times people ask me um, usually one of two things about the Seminoles. It's like, oh, aren't Seminoles just Creeks that moved into Florida? Not exactly. Or aren't Seminoles just a bunch of tribes mixed together? Not exactly. <laughs> um, we still have linguistically unique you know, cultural groups within our Seminole tribe. 
Um, so we do have a minority community that is Creek speaking Seminoles. It's a different language than the rest of the tribe speaks, which is the Miccosukee language. Um, so they're, they're related, but they're not mutually intelligible, just like Spanish and uh, French and Portuguese. Um, so they're related, but you can't necessarily understand one another. You know, there's similarities in grammar, syntax, there are some words that are the same, there are some words that are similar, and a lot of words that are completely different. Um, and so that's kind of interesting, you know, he's one of those few uh, speakers that's left of, of the Creek language in our tribe. In Oklahoma, they do have many more speakers because there's many more Seminoles that were relocated out there and Creeks that were relocated out there. Um, but they have the same issue that we have here is most of them are over 60 years old now. <laughs> which, you know, is not a, you know, sustainable way to maintain a language. Um, so it does start with a log. <laughs> um, you know, I think some people think, you know, I'm getting these logs kind of partially prepared or that I get them delivered to me or, um, you know, I buy it from a lumber mill or something like that. And it's usually not the case except for those two river logs, but then they still got delivered as logs. <laughs> And uh, again, you can see some of those early stages, making cross cuts, knocking those out, smoothing the sides down. Mm. Yeah, same thing with the inside, making cross cuts and then knocking it out with an ax. And uh, once the ax doesn't fit in there, then you start using an adz because it can fit into those curves much better. So and this was at our, um, we call it our, our Oakley Village in Hollywood, Florida. Um, it's not there anymore uh, right now. Hopefully they'll get another version of it up and running at some point here. But right now is non-functioning. So again, you can kind of see the remnants of those cross cuts from the chainsaw. But then you also see marks from ads on there as well. There's me. So I've actually used one on the water. People <laughs> ask me. Um, and get a lot of people. Wet. Yeah. Did you fall in and get out? <laughs> um, this was for filming for a, a documentary that, or a, somebody was trying to get a documentary going. So we're actually filming for a trailer for to hopefully make a documentary. Um, so there's a lot of walking through the water that day too. And every which way we could use that canoe, we did. So there's like me pulling, like you know, my friend Daniel, and um, uh, through the you know while he's sitting in the canoe and um, you know sitting in it and paddling it and push pulling it, and we did all different ways. Now. This is a 16 foot canoe. It is probably about 19, 20 inches across. So it's a little bit longer, a little bit wider than the ones out that's outside. I think I stood for a total of about 10 or 15 seconds on this one. <laughs> <laughs> and my uh, center of gravity is a, a little high and a little heavy. Uh, my friend Daniel, he's like almost, probably almost a foot shorter than me and, and probably about at least 100 pounds lighter. He had no problem push pulling the, the canoe. Uh, this one here, this is a 28 foot long dugout canoe. This one is a replica though. This one's made out of fiberglass. Um, the Atatagi Museum does have the original um, in our collection. Um, and so many years ago, the chairman had a, a boat builder um, make um, probably maybe 12 or 15 of these uh, replica fiberglass ones made. And so this is, um, in Chukaluski, Florida, and so it's actually just off the, the historic Smallwood store down there. Um, so it was actually a running trading post up until the 1970s, and then it became a, a museum. Um, so it's, it's a really cool old building that's been there for a long time, because um, especially in southwest Florida, there's not many old buildings that managed to survive development down there, unfortunately, but the Smallwood store that that family has been just really robust about, you know, maintaining and preserving their property and their rights to their property as well, because they've fought developers many times over the years. Um, and they've managed to win, you know, just as a little family against these 
huge, you know, multi-million dollar developers. Um, so yeah, this is me. That's not me, but I was uh, teaching a class on, on how to pull canoes. There's the small wood store there. You can see it. So these canoes are very, very heavy, the fiberglass ones. Um, and the boat builder, actually, in some of the canoes, he put a metal plate in the bottom of them, too, to try and keep them balanced more, I guess. But I, I don't know if it really needed it, but it definitely made them very heavy. Um, and so this one is actually one of the ones that our chairman gifted to the small wood store here. Um, so it was actually stored under here. Um, it was much harder to put back at the end of the day because some of the people left quickly. <laughs> so there are fewer of us to try and put it back under the under the store, but we managed to do it. Um, and moving a canoe is actually kind of a an awkward thing to try and do because you have this big thing. Even if you have a lot of hands, there's not many places to really get a good hold on the canoe. Um, the best thing to put it is like put boards or stout sticks or something under it so you actually have something to hold on to. But if you don't have that, it's, it's pretty difficult. Thankfully, this one has these seats, so there's actually there's something there to grab. Um, but yeah, that one's, I don't know, it's probably like 300 pound canoe or more. I don't know, it was, it was a lot. It was definitely a lot. Um, this is a kind of a cool find, you know, again, people always ask me, well, did you, did you burn the canoe or was there any burning involved? And I say that's about over 400 years ago, yes. Um, you know, there's documentation of um, not burning and scraping, but again, there's only a handful of those, you know, accounts of the burning and scraping. You know, there's been another 400 years of canoe carving history that has not included burning and scraping. Um, but for some reason, you know, every museum and historic site um, leaves out the next, you know, 400 years of canoe carving history. Not just Seminoles, but uh, pioneers and slaves and plantations were making dugout canoes as well. You know, as long as you had an axe and an adze, you had a free source of, you know, watercraft. Um, so, um, a little over a year ago, this washed up on Egmont Key which is at the entrance to Tampa Bay. Actually, the um, tugboats that ferry the, the cruise ships into Tampa Bay are docked on Egmont Key. And um, so anyhow, yeah, it's a state park now. You can um, get a ferry over there from Fort DeSoto. And, uh, but the caretaker of the island, he does a walk around the island every morning when he wakes up. And he said, I was walking around the island, and all of a sudden, there's this canoe just sitting on the on the beach. <laughs> you know, so I pulled it up a little bit higher so it wouldn't wash away. Um, and so, uh, you know, our museum was notified, the state was notified, Florida Public Archaeology was notified. And so the day I was there, um, just about all of them were, were there. Um, and so we're checking out the remnant of this this canoe that washed up. How old? I'll get to that in just a second oh, here. Yeah. Okay, so here you can kind of see what the canoe was originally shaped like. Um, so the canoe, this is actually like only one half and then the other half was split off. So it's like, you know, it's like either the right or the left side of the canoe. It's, it's hard to tell because we don't exactly know what orientation was of the bow and the stern, but by the design of this, it probably could have been uh, either way, because the prehistoric, um, you know, pre-European contact dugout canoes um, tended to be the same on both ends of the canoe. Um, so this is in that style of those prehistoric canoes. Um, and you can see it's very flat here, and then that shape. So again, this is actually the sidewall. This would be the bottom of the canoe in the back. Let's see here. So this is inside. So again, that's that flat part. So you're looking at it here. Now we're going to look at it from the top. Oops. Now we're going to look at it from the top. What I'm going to focus on is this part here that kind of 
corner in there. To me, these look like marks from a steel adze. And that corner is so sharp and clean. And right here, there's a little bit of a ledge there that's cut almost at a 90 degree angle straight down. Cutting across the grain of wood is very, very difficult, even with a sharp tool. It has to be a very, very sharp tool. Um, now, I don't really have any experience with stone tools, but I know this is difficult to do with a steel tool. So this leads me to believe that this was done with steel tools. And, you know, I recognize these chalk marks, and I know what tools have to fit in there. You can't fit in here with an axe. It has to be an axe to come this way. Um, well, that's the end. Let me back yes. up here. <laughs> and um, so, anyhow, so my belief is that that canoe that washed up on Egmont Key is a very early European contact native made dugout canoe. That was kind of a long title. <laughs> um, but, you know, radiocarbon dating that was done on it, the higher percentage of it says that it's earlier than European contact, but the radiocarbon dating does have a degree of error. So, um, if you're not very familiar with it, I'm not super familiar with it, but usually you get like somewhere from like a 70 to like 150 year date range. So it doesn't really narrow it down that much, but it'll give you that date range. So say 1900 to 2050 with, you know, a 60% probability that it's between 1920 and 1960, but it has a 15% chance of being after 2000. You know, so that's what it looks like when you get a report back from radiocarbon dating. So even though it has a higher probability from before European contact, I tend to think that because of the markings on the wood itself, how it was constructed, and my own personal knowledge of making canoes, I'm almost like 90, 95% sure this had to be done with steel tools, which would have to be after European contact of some sort. Um, so again, it's so early that they're still making the older style of canoe. They're just doing it with the new tools that are now available to them, um, which is what I've been saying to people for years. And there's finally a canoe that washed up to corroborate what I've been telling people that, you know, we stopped burning and scraping the canoes that we started using steel tools on them. We started using the most modern technology available to us. Um, so anyhow, yeah, that was just a cool thing that happened at the, the end of last year and um you know i feel fortunate to be a part of that you know egmont key itself has you know a pretty long and storied history um it was used as a prison camp for seminoles before they ship us out to oklahoma um so there's you know actually seminole graves on the island we don't know where they're at but we know that there were seminoles that died there um just from the reports and records from the u.s military um, I know for the military, it was, it was a plus because then it was, you know, less people that they had to transport to Oklahoma. They actually would write that in their uh, reports back to Washington. Mm. Um, you know, of course, you know, a lot of Seminoles died en route because our first stop was Oklahoma, or not Oklahoma, was uh, New Orleans. There are Seminole graves in New Orleans <laughs> mm. because we either died in between here and New Orleans or after arriving shortly mm. after in New Orleans. Um, so that's just, you know, the Seminole War history of Egmont Key. Um, today there's tourist boats that go there and go shelling and it's actually a very pretty place um, that has a history that very few people know about the island actually. Because most people only see the, the shore. Um, I'm not sure if there's really a lot of like history placards around the island either that really explain a lot of what's, what happened on the island um, over the years. Um, currently, the island's slowly washing away, though. They're, you know, not sure exactly uh, how to remediate that that issue with the island. Um, so, anyhow, well, that's about the end of my presentation here. There's three of my kiddos um, <laughs> sitting in the canoe. My my oldest daughter is the one that took this photo, actually. But uh, that probably about sums up my two-year-old's personality there. <laughs> <laughs>
She's a, a handful and a ham. But so does anybody have any questions? That's oh, good to see. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I had two questions. One, when I was talking to you earlier this week, you were saying that when you went back to retrieve the log, that the mosquitoes were so bad that you had to wear like all kinds of protective clothing. Mm -hmm. How did the Seminoles deal with mosquitoes? And the second question I have is, if you took one of these canoes of yours and put it over in Venice, would a gondolier be able to maneuver? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not, because uh, looking at the gondolas, they are very canoe shaped, but they're they're pretty wide and long, so I think they're probably a lot more stable than, than our dugout canoes. So I don't know. Maybe since they're on the water so much, they probably would have a pretty short learning curve, though, I think. As far as mosquitoes, um, one of the best ways we found is that we didn't have the government and Army Corps controlling our water for us at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so what do mosquitoes need for breeding and multiplying? Stagnant water. Stagnant still water. Um, what's the one thing we learn about the Everglades and its water flow? It's, well, maybe I'll learn it more because I'm down there. <laughs> it, it flows very slowly south from Lake Okeechobee and goes down, you know, exits out into the Gulf and Florida Bay. And then, so it's moving very slowly, or it was moving. Um, but then you come the development years. Um, you know, down our ways, you know, starting in the, probably around the turn of the century and continuing pretty well up until about the 1960s and 70s of um, heavy dredging of canals, dredging of the canals that use that and build up roadways. Um, so say like you have, say this is the state of Florida, and you build a road from here to here and the water is supposed to flow from here to here. What does that road do? stops the water so now you have millions of acres of stagnant water that is now creating a problem of mosquitoes um, so like I showed a picture of a, a, a hammock island earlier in the presentation um, there's a good chance that hammock is underwater right now um, because of um, water being redirected um, into the Everglades, but north of US 41 and flooding out that area that historically really doesn't flood this time of the year. Um, and it looks like it's going to be many months until the water actually goes down. Because the water is being redirected from southeast Florida um, to keep, you know, the highly populated southeastern coast of, you know, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, all that area from being flooded because they're having flooding issues uh, more and more every year. And so they're saying out to the Everglades, but you know the people that do and live out in the Everglades, it's causing a problem for them. Um, and so all these, you know, hammocks. Um, the water is almost over 41 U.S. 41. This highway um, in some spots. And so, um, so going back to your question, you know, the water used to flow freely, and especially during the summertime when the water would, you know, fill up even more, it would flush out the Everglades and you know, basically clean it out every year of mosquito and debris and things like that. Well, that hasn't been happening as naturally lately. Um, with that being said, you know, we did still have mosquitoes. They weren't non-existent. Um, but like from what my mother tells me, she says she doesn't really remember them being as bad when she was a young girl, but they're very bad now where we, you know, have things like, you know, elections for mosquito control district, you know, administrators. Um, you know, um, neat little fact, Collier County uses uh, more uh, mosquito control chemicals than any other county in the state. Um, also have very high cancer rates, but, uh, and uh, very few bees as well. Um, so, but one of the other things that we would do is we would have what's called, a, we call it mosquito bar, but basically it's just a mosquito netting um, and it's not really netting where you just use like a thin uh, muslin type cloth and just kind of make a little cloth room and we'd sleep in that at night to, you know, be pretty bug free as you slept overnight. So, sorry, big answer to your <laughs> short question. But. Cup questions. Um, are there silt mosquitoes in the Everglades? Yes. 
Okay, and uh, what about, when we saw the picture of the, the tree, why they were elevated here? Why did not they go layer on the... Why didn't they cut the tree lower? Yeah, yeah. Um, simply because the tree is skinnier once you get about like six feet off the ground. Um, so it's less to cut through if they get a little bit higher. So it's actually a pretty common uh, practice or was a common practice uh, when trees were still being cut with um, axes and crosscut saws. Um, so they, you know, get up six feet and they'd have several less feet that they'd have to cut through to get the tree down. One other question. Uh, are you painting your canoe in what color? <laughs> um, this canoe, I'm not going to paint it. Um, I'm going to um, do a layer of linseed oil. This, that way I'll just highlight the, the wood grain of, of the canoe. But again, it's not traditional or historic finish for it, but it, it'll make it look real pretty. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it would work for putting in the water as well, um, but I would have to reapply it pretty often if I was using this canoe like all the time on a regular basis. So probably like every few months I'd have to reapply the oil coat. But that's the nice thing about oil, you can just slather more of it on where if you have like um like a poly type finish you know that acts basically as a thin plastic shell around you know whatever you paint it on you have to like strip all of it off and then put a new oh. go around otherwise you kind of the water will seep between the the layers and it won't come back out <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna take it out and try it out. Right? <laughs> I said it'll, it'll be up to these folks over here. <laughs> yes. I noticed on the stern you have like a 45 degree angle cut uh, in. Uh huh. Is there a reason for the front instead of squaring it off at the back? Um, that way you can use the canoe in either direction. Again, but like I said, I showed you an example where there was one that was squared off. You know, right. I think it might have just been a repair type thing, but it, you know, I wasn't there, so it could have been they just decided to make it that way because um, there are wooden boats that are built that way, and obviously, you know, we weren't living in a complete, you know, bubble, so we would see, you know, European style made boats, and my, you might say, hey, I think I like the way that looks, and you know, I'm gonna make my next canoe with that feature on it. So it wasn't significant, like you do the, the bow coming in to part the reeds or mm -hmm. ferns or whatever it was, the swamp area. Yeah. There's no reason for it being that shape of the back, except you found that if yeah. you had to back up, it's easier to do it. <laughs> so what I was told is that our old canoes used to look like that on, on both sides. On both ends? Yeah. And, and so he's, he's talking about this. Yeah. So he's talking about this part of the canoe. So I was told us that our old canoes are made like this on both sides, um, but that we actually um, took this design from uh, European boats that we saw. Okay. So then we kind of added that that feature onto our canoes. So when you knew, you took your log and you went across the top, it didn't produce two canoes it's just one yeah I mean because even uh, this one here the very center is still within the, the canoe so if we split it in half your yeah, canoe is going to lose yeah. probably about a good four to six inches of height unless had a, well, yeah unless you have a huge cypress tree then you could do do that um, but otherwise usually the, the heart of the tree ends up being kind of high on the canoe, but it still ends up being a part of, the, yeah. of that canoe. So like if the center line of the tree would actually end up being right about here, you know, instead of up here somewhere. So you have a question back there. These canoes look like they do not draw a lot of water. Mm -hmm. They float very high. Now when you mount a sail, like a spritzel, how do you keep them from crowding sideways? Do you use lee boards or ballast or? Um, so I mean, I don't actually have any personal experience sailing these canoes. It's something we probably haven't done since about the 1950s or so. Um, so yeah, there's no dagger board or lee board that's used on the canoes. Usually what happens is that you just sit in the back here and you have a paddle and you just keep that in the water and that kind of acts as a rudder combo lee board sort of um 
you know, when we're not using these in super high winds because if this tilts like 45, you'll just <laughs> fill up, you know. So you, I think you definitely got to know the conditions that you're using it in, um, you know, be able to um, use that sail in, in the conditions or refit, you know, make it a little bit shorter um, so that you're not catching as much wind in the sail um, or be very good at dropping the sail quickly so you don't flip the, the canoe over. But again, most of the places that we're using these, the water's pretty shallow. So, I mean, if you flip it, usually you can just stand up. Um, but, so, yeah, I mean, there's really no, nothing that kind of keeps it, you know, from drifting. And, you know, that's kind of a part of, like, indigenous sailing is you kind of just take into account the, the drift that comes with, with the sail and not having that... Um, you know, dagger board, lee board, or a deep ballast on it, you know, that, that helps keep it from drifting. Because, um, like, even like the, um, you know, indigenous people of, of Oceania, Polynesia, and Micronesia, all those different areas, um, you know, they're, they're still doing, you know, deep sea voyaging with their dugout canoes, but they, they, you know, they don't have any lee boards or dagger boards or anything like that on it. They just take it into account of, of their lines that they're sailing. Now their canoes are very, very large. They're about, they'll use two canoes, um, two large canoes, and they'll be almost the width of this room and probably about a good 10 feet longer. Um, but that's the size they're using to make, you know, trips um, around the world still today. All right, any other last questions? Comments, concerns, complaints. <laughs> Any complaints? My name is Josh. You won't be here. Yeah. You get to be the scapegoat. Joshua, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate you being here. I'll be out here. Tomorrow, still carving away, so if anybody else wants to <laughs> see me making more wood shavings. <laughs> all right. And thank you all uh, for coming in or for watching the call. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much.